Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So yesterday during my Game of Thrones Religions video, I asked you all to submit questions. So now we'll try and figure out what everyone's thinking about what's really going on with the gods. I know the Emmys were last night too, and you guys felt like they got the shaft a little. Game of Thrones did win a lot of technical Emmys, so we could feel happy about that. But I'll also announce who won the book giveaway whenever we get through everything. And if you're just finding me for the first time, I do a weekly Game of Thrones book giveaway. All you have to do to enter that is be a subscriber and leave a comment whenever I post a bonus video. So general spoilers for everything through season four. But here we go. Question number one, Shadow Wolf asks, do the dragons have gods? So I think of the dragons as being more like highly evolved animals. They're like really intuitive flying lizards. I think that they just operate on primal instinct, but they are connected to the balance of nature in a way that hasn't been fully explained. I think it's more likely that people would have worshipped them. In a general sense, dragons were to Valyrians what horses are to Dothraki. They're part of the culture and highly respected. You could argue that they serve the old gods, or the god of nature, or however you want to think about it, but serving and worshipping are two completely different things. I think dragons are connected to fire magic. Rollers presented as the Lord of Light, so you could link them to him too. Then there's the Daenerys Azor Ahai theories, which I've talked about in my other theory videos. So if I had to pick, I would say they exist on the side of the Red God or the Old Gods, but I don't think it's going to be that simple. Just to explain how they're connected to fire magic or the seasons or the balance of the seasons, essentially whenever dragons started to proliferate, the world started to get hotter, like the climate started to increase, and as they started to die off, the climate started to get colder. Thus, dragons have a certain connection to the balance of the seasons. But question number two, Rainbow Fish Bubbles asks, do you think that the children of the forest might someday serve the Great Other, or will the children make the White Walkers bow down to them and their gods? So, the children were involved in stopping the forces of the Great Other after the Long Night, or at the end of the Long Night. So, it's implied that they have a more neutral position. It was implied that a peace treaty was brokered to end the Long Night, and they were involved in sealing that pact. I think it's more likely that they'll just serve nature, and depending on which way the balance tips, they'll serve one side or the other. The children do seem to have some sort of weird relationship with the Three-Eyed Raven, and it's implied that he might be in service of the Great Other, but I don't necessarily think that that means that the children are in service of the Great Other. And even if that's true, that's all just rumors and theories, though. I mean, if priests of the Red God can disagree with each other, then so can the Green Seers. The Three-Eyed Raven is the last Green Seer. That is until Bran came to learn from him. So even if the children are working on the opposing side of the Red God, it doesn't mean they're surrendering or bowing down. It would probably only be in service of the natural order of things. For example, if the dragon started to overpopulate and the climate of the world heated up so much that everything turned into a desert, the children would probably try to restore balance by serving the Great Other. On to question number three, Applex asks, who did the Valyrians worship? So they actually worshipped a variety of deities, there wasn't any main one god. The Valyrian Freehold was created after the Valyrians tamed dragons and used them to conquer the eastern continent. So just like the Greeks or Romans, you ended up with a wide variety of citizens from conquered nations with all of their own gods. Beyond that, we don't know if the Valyrians had any kind of organized religion before they tamed dragons and conquered the eastern continent. Because they lived in this area near Slaver's Bay in the Summer Sea, you could tie them to a lot of the local religions that are practiced in marine nowadays. I'm not an expert on the evolution of religion, but most early religion relates mostly to burial rites, like the way the religion of the old gods doesn't have a lot of complex customs. George R. R. Martin has teased that we will see glimpses of old Valyria pre-Doom in Winds of Winter and Dream of Spring though. Right now, the only people in the series that have claimed to actually travel there is Euron Greyjoy, which seems like the show is going to be cutting him out, and Tywin Lannister's younger brother, Jarian Lannister. He traveled to Valyria to try and recover Bright Roar. That was the lost Valyrian blade of House Lannister, but he never returned. He's actually like a whole other interesting character, who was like a really good friend to Tyrion as a child. I don't think the show's going to do that character either, but Tyrion could totally run into him again in the books. But onto question number four, Edward Fall asks, what do you think is going to happen at the end of the series? Wow, as spoilery as this answer could get, I did a, like a White Walker prophecy video and you can just watch that. I get into like really great details about, you know, how the balance might be restored with the brokering of a truce and a peace treaty. So I go into great detail into that. I'll add a link in the description. Think about it this way though. It's all about maintaining the balance of nature. So a lot of allegiances in the show will probably shift around and people that you think are heroes will probably end up being villains. Question number five, Joanna Adams asks, can weirwood trees be grown or transplanted? Probably not transplanted, but they can certainly be grown. Like you could take seeds and plant new trees. I don't think that they're like the Ents from Lord of the Rings though. The trees are connected to a certain type of nature magic, but they're not just going to pick up and start running around. I'm really hoping that we learn more about them in season five of the show, but we'll definitely learn more about them in Winds of Winter. Question number six, Brian Navarro asks, 
Does the Great Other have sleeper cells around the world, and do other people besides the White Walkers worship him? So, it depends on how you view him. Is he like an evil god, or is he like a god of nature? There could be people in the north that say prayers to him. In terms of sleeper cells, no, I don't think it's going to work that way. I think it's going to be more like during Aegon's conquest. Aegon allowed people to surrender or join his army. Obviously, the White Walkers aren't going to let people join their army. They're going to turn them into whites. Think about it this way. They start with their forces in the lands of Always Winter. Then as they push south, they slowly kill people and turn them into whites, making the army stronger. Since we saw the White Walker march right past Samwell at the end of Season 2, it's possible that they could leave people alone if they don't perceive them to be threats. The further south that they push, the larger their army will grow. At a certain point, I think we'll see people try and serve the true balance of nature, and if the forces of the Red God are doing something to thwart that, people could take action against them, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be serving the White Walkers or the Great Other. Another really simple way to think about it is the enemy of my enemy is my friend, so you can see characters switch sides based on those principles. Question number seven, Tomo asks, whose storyline are they going to cut out in season five? It's not so much about them cutting storylines out, it's about them cutting characters out and giving those character stories to other characters. For example, we haven't heard about the Greyjoy uncles being cast. Those people do a few pretty important things in book four, so it's possible that they could give those parts of the story to Theon's sister, Yara. Her name in the books is different than that on the show, but you get the idea. They did the same thing with Gendry in season three. They gave Edric Storm's story from Storm of Swords to him, and then they give Gendry's story or some of it to Hot Pie. The big parts of the story stay pretty close to the books. The biggest changes that you really notice are the characters themselves. Like characters show up in places that they didn't show up in the books. But question number eight, VOD asks, if you had to choose a religion, which one would you pick? I do like me some resurrection, but I'd probably pick the old gods just because it seems like the simplest. I wouldn't have to sit through like long boring rituals or church sermons like in the Faith of the Seven. I don't know about you guys, but it feels like a lot of times in the books, people's religions just have a lot to do with their personalities. Like Arya worships death because she's so hardcore now, but before that she worshiped the old gods just like her family. I feel like my personality changes a lot over time, just as much as characters in the story. So I feel like I might say something different in a couple years, but for right now I'll just say old gods, just to keep it simple. Question number nine, Virus asks, where is the blackfish? Where has he been hiding since the Red Wedding? This is actually the rare case where after the Red Wedding, the books and the show do pretty much the same thing, but then there's a bit of a divergence. He ended up escaping the Red Wedding Massacre because he was outside the castle whenever shit went down. He ran back to River Run and he's been holed up there since then. If you remember, River Run sits on a small piece of land in a body of water, so whenever he pulls the drawbridge up, the castle can only be reached by boats, so they can't just march an army right up to the gates. The show is basically cutting out the River Run part of the story that we see from Book 4, so if you have read Book 4, they're not going to do River Run at all, or it doesn't seem like they are. The Blackfish does have a pretty interesting story in Book 4, but I suppose they could always come back to him at a future point. Either way, he's still alive in the books and on the show. He's just on the run. And question number 10, last one. Nicole Mott asks, do people get res sickness when they get brought back to life? Reduced stats suck. I actually laughed at this a little bit because I used to be totally addicted to Warcraft. But yes, there is a little bit of res sickness. Beric Dondarrion on the show said that each time Roller brought him back from the dead, it felt like a little piece of him got left behind, so presumably there is a limit to the number of times someone can be brought back. And when you do get brought back, you are slightly lesser than you were before, so you do have slightly reduced stats. So far the known limit to resurrection is Lady Stoneheart, like she's the furthest gone we've seen a person be and come back. I think she was special just because of the circumstances of her death and the will of her mind, so I don't think that she's like an absolute limit. I think she's a special case. But hopefully that answers some of your guys' big questions. Thank you so much for submitting them. I always love doing these videos. My next bonus video is going to be about the civil war between the Faith Militant and the Crown. That happened like a long time before events on the show. I'll try and post that on next Sunday. And congratulations to this week's giveaway winner, Marcus Gaskins. You win your choice of any of Martin's books you want, Kindle or paperback. I'll message you on your channel for details. Remember, all you guys have to do to enter the giveaway or enter for consideration is be a subscriber and just leave a comment whenever I post bonus videos. But there's a whole lot of stuff happening this week and I'll be posting updates on Twitter and Facebook. So if you want to follow me there, I'll have links for that at the bottom of the description. But in the meantime, as promised, you can click here to learn all about that White Walker prophecy if you never saw that video that I posted. And you can click here to learn all about the Faceless Men. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tonight. High fives.